When I'm trying to make my RTL simulation go fast, the first thing I think of is parallel execution. First, you break up your design into various levels and then start with the first one and try to beat that level. And then you work your way up the hierarchy until you get to the boss level. And then, well, then if you don't get a save point, then you lose all of your work and you have to start over again against that stupid looking crab thing. And Wait, I think I'm confusing this with one of my video games. Oh, anyway, it turns out it's really hard to make RTL simulation scale. Getting the best performance is a combination of increasing single core speed and, very cleverly, partitioning the task so that parallel machines can give you the kind of performance boost you'd expect. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Cadence's third generation Excellium simulator does all that stuff for you. So you don't have to beat any boss level villains to make your simulation go really, really fast. My guest today is Dave Lederbach from Cadence Design Systems, and we're going to talk all about this and more. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about Cadence Design Systems' Excellium Parallel Simulator. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Amelia. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so before we dive into the details of Excellium, Cadence has a wide range of verification tools and solutions. Give us a quick overview of the Cadence verification world. It's a great question. Cadence is focused on system design enablement and having the fastest engines for formal, for simulation, for emulation and for prototyping is important, but also making them smart, making them integrated, using our verification fabric to bridge the differences in the way those different tools are used. So having the verification fabric, such as VIP, where the optimizations for formal or for simulation or for emulation are different for each of those, but yet bridges the use as you move and flow from one step to the next is really important. It's the same for debug. It's the same for portable stimulus. Our Perspect tool is used to create stimulus that can be used in all the different engines and even taken into the lab for your testing there. So having the smartest, the fastest, and the most optimized engines and fabric for accomplishing a verification flow is critical, we think, towards getting the design done in time. Okay, Dave, let's dive into simulation now. Cadence has been big in simulation for a long time. Can you give us a little history of Cadence and simulation? Yeah, when we look back at simulation back in the 90s, for example, when we were moving from schematics to VHDL and Verilog, the test bench side was much simpler. We used interpreted code simulators and we were getting great gains in performance on the processors we were running on, 200 to 400 to 800 gigahertz, eventually plateauing around four gigahertz, and typical usable frequencies were two gigahertz, three gigahertz. We moved from 32-bit to 64-bit during that time to improve things as much as possible. But the real changes that happened during that time were the test bench became much more complex. So we went from engineers and two or three engineers sharing a simulator, being very interactive with very simple test bench requirements to in the early 2000s, we had very large designs. We had designs that needed to be broken up into pieces in order to really get the kind of insight into the design verification that we needed. Yeah. So test benches, methodology, and standardization was needed to support these more complex designs and the SOC convergence. At the same time, the processor speed plateaued around 4 gigahertz, pushing the compute platforms to use multiple cores. Compiled code simulation engines such as Incisive were created to really support a coverage-based verification where we were merging hundreds of regressions results per night, really. Mm. And so we went to shared simulators to now individual verification engineers where you're running hundreds to thousands or more of simulations overnight to really take a more of a metric-driven approach to figure out how to verify and where the bugs were and to fix the designs. So what happened during that time, though, is a lot of focus was on the test bench side and all the new requirements on testing, but the design side was still unable to be parallelized. Mm, right. So we call that compiled code simulator 
era, the second generation of simulation. Okay. Huge improvements in approaches and in methodologies and in standardization, but still a limiting factor was our ability to run the design side because as you have events going through your simulation, you never know where the next event's going to come from in the database and running it in a compiled code simulator one thing after another just really wasn't getting us the kind of speed improvements we need right. year over year as these designs get bigger and more complex. So that's where we moved into Excelium. Okay. And that's what we'll talk about more in this talk is how we go to a third generation where we can really take a new technology mm -hmm. and find a way to dramatically improve the performance on that design side and use the resources that are available today in the server farms that we all have to improve that verification flow. Nice. All right. So we're going to be talking about this latest version of Excelium and the performance we can get with parallel simulation. Let's go into that. Exactly. So this is something that is what we think a new technology that really defines the start of the third generation of simulation technology. Okay. And so the team at Rocketic spent nine years figuring out how do we take the design side of the simulation that no one has yet been able to parallelize how do we identify the independent pieces that could then be spread across the multiple cores that are available in our server farms and dramatically improve, get orders of magnitude potentially of simulation runtime improvement through that technology? Yeah. So what we did was we combined the Rocketic technology with new engines, refactored, re-architected engines from Incisive, and we created a new simulator called the Excelium Parallel Simulator Platform. Okay. With the new re-architected engines that are much faster, much more robust for very large SOCs, even your single core simulations that are still a compiled code simulation in Excelium single core yeah. have the ability to bring 2x improvement in performance, a lot of new automation for reducing uh, manual effort. And when you move to multi-core, we're able to get an additional 3x in RTL, 5x nice. in gate level simulation, and 10x in very high event density tests like design for test and fault insertion for ATPG and those kind of runs that can take three weeks. We can bring those down to a number of days. Nice. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's dive into some details here. What's involved in the Excelium solution and how much performance can it really buy us? So as we've re-architected and refactored engines that are in, that come from originally from the proven technology in Incisive, yeah. and as we've brought those over into Excelium, so many of your block and IP level tests will still run in single core mode. Okay. You don't get enough advantage in multi-core mode to necessarily make use of that. Okay. But in single core mode, you'll get approximately a one and a half to two X improvement over what you're used to in the latest version of Incisive. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So that helps. And the beauty is that you don't make any changes to your design. Okay. Your test bench stays the same. Your way of interacting for debug stays the same. Your methodology for handling your design under test and the way you write your code, there are no new limitations to how you create your design, create your test bench, or do your debugging or your uh, regressions. Fantastic. So okay. everything runs the same, yeah. When you map over from Incisive to Excelium, in compatibility mode, we map those commands and options to the equivalent commands and options in Excelium. Okay. And so going forward, we're gonna be able to preserve Incisive for archive tests and legacy designs that need to maintain their scripts and everything from an Incisive design. Right. But as you move your project over into Excelium, we're going to be able to bring the new capabilities, the new automations, the new default behavior changes into the Excelium commands and options and improve all of that without any danger of impacting your legacy designs on the incisive side. Nice. So it's really the best of both worlds. As you move from your IP and block level designs into much larger full chip simulations, that's where the multicore comes in to play and becomes a huge advantage in your performance runtime and in your capacity capabilities for those big designs and those big chips. Okay, Dave, so how exactly do those two work together? The multicore technology is integrated with the single core technology. Okay. So in other words, the behavior simulator, the compiled code simulator, that we've been describing is integrated with the multi-core technology when the design environment is in the verification environment are brought into Excelium, yeah. it automatically partitions and figures out the acceleratable part on the design side and the non-acceleratable part, which is typically the test bench code. Right. Okay. So those two can run together. You can take that partition design, 
that's designed and elaborated for multi-core. And you can choose at runtime, do I want to just stay with one core, share it amongst both sides? Mm -hmm. Or do I want to split it into two cores, three cores, seven cores, eight cores? I can choose the number of cores that's appropriate for the resources I have on hand. And so as you run your simulation, the design side that is acceleratable is mapped across the multiple cores available. And then the two sides talk to each other. Uh -huh. The behavioral simulator is still the master. And so you can think of the multi-core simulation as a, as a co-simulation or as an accelerator to the regular simulator. It's a four-state simulator. X's and Z's are included along with zeros and ones. So all of the X propagation work, all of the other kinds of low power and different technologies that I've been using are available whether I'm in single core mode or in multi-core mode and getting the acceleration and the higher capacity. Excellent. Okay. So what does that mean specifically in terms of performance on a single core? So on the single core side, the performance comes from the refactored and re-architected engines that yeah. come in. We don't need the multi-core technology to improve the single core speed up. So right. the single core speed up, we get about a 2x improvement, anywhere from 1.2 to 4x across different kinds of, of events. We're seeing huge improvements in randomization and in a number of other areas. And those improvements will continue because we think that single core simulation is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. We need to get through block and IP level simulation before we get to full chip simulation. Typically. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So now Excelium isn't just about simulating faster, right? You guys have added a whole bunch of new functional capabilities. That's right. That's right. And that's part of where we talk about best-in-class engines being both fast and smart. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times there's manual effort that could be removed with better automation. Sure. So, for example, in uh, coverage and other areas, I spend a lot of effort mapping my exclude points, fixing my connections when I have changes to my design and I mm -hmm. want to maintain the exclude points that are already established. Right. So we can automate that. Same thing in multi-snapshot incremental elaboration when I want to partition the design into primary and incremental parts of the design, parts that are staying unchanged and parts that are changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to automate that and make that a lot easier to use. Sure. So we continue to improve the automation wherever possible to improve the overall throughput and the overall turnaround time for your simulations and for your verification process. All right, Dave, and, and there's more to improving productivity than just simulating faster, right? What do you do to speed up my whole verification flow? You're absolutely right. And there are a lot of design types that don't need just raw speed. Sure. They need a lot of improvement in automation to remove manual effort. Yeah. So a number of the features that we've brought out are geared especially for that. If I'm running long simulations and I get to a point of interest, I need to debug, I don't want to have to rerun all of that setup time. Sure. So save and restore has been re-architected to be much more SOC robust. It'll take the biggest types of SOC designs and still be able to use save and restore. Nice. In the past, it was very great for small blocks and IP. Now it's great for full chip. And then on top of that, we've added the capability to change those tests. Mm, okay. So in the past, if I wanted to do a new test, I needed to rerun that setup time to get to a new restore point. Right. Now I can reuse those restore points even though I'm changing my test. And so dynamic test reload allows me to quickly change that test and develop a new test that can now reuse those restore points. So that can bring some huge improvements in performance by skipping those hours of, of setup time in the simulation. Right. Another area is incremental elaboration. A lot more automation is available to help us take the primary partitions that aren't changing and the incremental partitions that are changing and reuse those and distribute those amongst my teams. Right. So being able to automate that so that you can quickly out of the box use it makes it available for a lot more people and a lot more teams without a big ramp up or startup learning curve. Coverage refinement is an area where there's a lot of manual effort going on. As I have cover groups and as I change my design, I have to reconnect those linkages. And if I have an area that's excluded, the connections that are underlying the hierarchy of that need to be manually identified as exclude points. Now sure. with smart exclude and with refinement resilience, we can eliminate that manual effort. And that mm. can save days to weeks of time, especially for iterative processes. And then additional areas, test bench coverage. When you inherit a test bench, you don't know what's been turned off, what's been turned on. You might have a memory interface that you think is testing your design. Right. And if that's been turned off, you might 
skip something that you really need to know. Right. So with test bench coverage, you get a metric reporting of what's been active. Mm, okay. And so with IMC or with the manager, you get the full report. We think test bench coverage is important enough that it should be an additional sign-off metric. Mm, sure. Now, one issue I have is all the special manual tweaks I have to make to my design. It's hard to maintain that as my design evolves. Right, Dave? That's very true. Wherever we can, we're trying to make sure that we come up with automations that can reduce that manual effort. Right. And, and as I mentioned briefly before, the coverage exclusion, the smart exclude, and the mm -hmm. refinement resilience allows me to automate the changes and the accommodation of those changes. So as I have design changes on each of my regression runs, and as the connections get broken to my exclude points, I can remap those automatically for you so you don't have to continue to manually trace those down and reconnect those, for example. Nice. Okay. Now, Dave, let's talk a little bit about test benches. What does Excellium do for me in my system Verilog world? So test benches have become very, very complex. Yes. And as we share the test benches, as we try to make sure that they are reusable or that they meet the standards, it's really important to be able to understand what's working and what's not. Yeah. So test benches have become very complex with many classes containing different methods. And then once a full regression has completed, how do you know which tests have been exercised? Right. Test bench class-based block coverage metrics can ensure that all the intended tests have been fully used. This should be an additional sign-off metric required for chip tape out, we think. Mm -hmm. The unexercised portions of UVM test benches need to be examined. You need to find out which knobs or sequences have not been exercised, which instantiated classes versus uninstantiated classes. You can even run the test bench coverage before the design under test is created to provide insight into how comprehensive your test bench is. So with test bench coverage, which is unique to Excellium, you have a huge advantage now in making your test benches more efficient, mm -hmm. checking whether they're working well, and identifying areas that are not being tested that you intend to test. Okay, Dave, now how do I keep track of all my coverage information from all of these different sources? That's a great question, Amelia. We have a number of ways of tracking where your progress is in the verification. Built into Excellium is the Integrated Metrics Center, and that brings you block coverage, functions and tasks, a number of other methods of, in a metrics way, recording what's going on and keeping track of what's going on. Okay. A much more sophisticated approach is to use our vManager product, and that really helps your metric-driven verification with everything from planning, through tracking, through merging your regression results from formal, from simulation, from emulation, and bringing all those results together in such a way that you can avoid overlap mm, in okay. the effort that you're doing. Right. Okay. So earlier you mentioned dynamic test reload. Now, what's that all about? So dynamic test reload is something that allows you to take current restore points that you've used for save and restore. Okay. And now you can make changes to your tests and allow you to reuse those restore points. Oh, okay. So in the past, you would have always had to change those tests and then rerun your entire simulation to get to the restore point, the point of interest, right. and now use those new tests. Mm, okay. Typically what will happen is I'm using a restore point, and I'm using save and restore, and I'm debugging a problem, or I'm figuring out if the functional activity and behavior is what I want it to be. Mm -hmm. And then in the process of that, I realize there's other tests that I want to make. Yeah. And if I could only make those subtle changes to the tests and reuse that restore point and skip those hours of simulation runtime, that would be wonderful. So now we've made the ability to do that. Cool. Okay. Now, what can we expect performance-wise using multi-core compared with our single core? Great question. It's very dependent upon our level of event density. Oh, sure. Okay. So on top of the improvement from incisive to Excellium that we're seeing in the 2x you know, average range... We can get a 3x improvement for RTL, about a 5x improvement for gate level simulations, and about a 10x improvement for very high event density simulations such as design for test, ATPG runs, that kind of thing. Okay. 
Now, I've always understood that parallelizing simulation was tricky and was a bit of a diminishing returns kind of situation. Uh, what have you done to make simulation more scalable? So that is exactly the problem that the entire EDA industry has been working on for about 10 years. Right, a decade. And, yeah, <laughs> and on the design side, it's really tough because you don't know where your next event's coming from in the database. And so you don't really know how to identify the independencies that you can use to spread across multiple multiple cores. Right. You might think, oh, well, most designs today are multi-core. I've got four cores. I've got octa-cores in there. I could just break those into four different pieces or eight different pieces. But the problem is that the real-world use cases use those cores together. Right. And so I can't just break them up because they are very interdependent. Mm -hmm. So what the Rocketic team spent time over the last nine years figuring out was how do you identify the independencies that can then be broken across multiple cores? Oh, right. And that was a very tricky thing. They were not from the EDA industry, so they had, in some oh. ways, they had an advantage. Right, yes. And so, <laughs> you know, as they looked at the different algorithms that were available, and as they looked at the different technologies for multi core, they recognized that the ability to identify a particular structure, loops or DSP algorithms, if you think of how a counter, a finite state machine, a FIFO, an adder all look very much the same. Mm -hmm. Identifying the right algorithm to break that into pieces, the right optimization for that can be very tricky. And then as those sets of code are defined differently, you may or may not be able to identify what can be accelerated and what can't. Sure. On top of that, any variables come into play. So until I know the length of my loop, until I know how other parts of the structure are set up, I don't have the ability to really uh, amplify that. So essentially what I need to do is I need to be able to figure out the dependencies and the interdependencies yeah. in my design code. So the Rocketech team spent nine years. They went through a number of different algorithms and they, they went through six or seven algorithms rejecting different approaches. Mm -hmm. And as they were doing their work, they were targeting GPU resources. And the GPU cards with hundreds of small processing elements are geared towards pipelining and gaining you know, frames per second. Right. And so there was both an advantage and a disadvantage here. By being forced to go to that fine grain with those very small processing elements, they had to go very fine grained in their understanding of the design code. Sure. The best analogy I've heard is to look at it at the always block level. Mm, okay. So if you consider an always block, it's got inputs, it has outputs, it has a number of things that are connected to it to initialize or reset it. And so if you can identify the string of events related to that always block at that fine grain level, then I have a piece of independent portion of the simulation that I can separate out from the rest of the simulation and then I can use that to parallelize my design. Right. So because they were forced to go to that fine grain level, they were able to do, they were forced to do that. And so if I figure that my event string looks like A, B, C, D, E, F, G for that particular always block and I identify that independent set of events, I have one independent chunk. And now I'm going to look for the next one, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. So there's some overlap there, but again, another independent set of events. Sure. And now I'm going to find all the millions of independent sets that are in my design. And from that, I build what's called a complex dependency graph. And now I have something that I can map across independent cores and let them run separately from each other and talk back to my simulation. So what we're describing here is that they found that simply unwrapping structures into a queue was just not sufficient. Even structures that appeared to partition cleanly have dependencies in other parts of the design. Sure. The typical way that the EDA industry was looking at trying to parallelize the design either went with completely reinventing the simulation entirely from right. soup to nuts, yeah. which would have meant a dramatic and disruptive change, or the way the Rocketic team looked at it was, let's focus on the design side that people have not been able to parallelize, yeah. and let's allow that to work with, to talk back with the test bench improvements that everyone's been able to make dramatic improvements over time mm. for the very complex test bench side. So we're using the compiled code simulator for the portions of the design that cannot be accelerated. Yeah. And then we're using the multi-core resources to parallelize the design side, which this new technology allows us to use. So what did your team come up with to address these issues? Can't we just throw 64 cores at it every time? 
<laughs> that, that's a really great question. So when you look at multi-core and you look at some of the performance improvements, you're like, well, why don't we just throw you know all the cores we have at it and right. just make it run in no time? Sure. And the reality is that when you bring the design in and you allow Excelium to partition it, you get a portion of the design that can be parallelized, typically yeah. the design side. And then you get a portion that still is not independent at all, which is oftentimes mostly the test bench side. So things that can be directly associated with the core hardware events, such as system Verilog assertions, can be accelerated. But other parts of UVM and that are just not able to be identified fine grain that way at this time. Right. So if half of my event density is on the test bench side, and then half of my event density is on the design side, and I can accelerate that, mm -hmm. even if I make that run in no time at all, I still have half of the simulation time that needs to be run. Right. So Amdahl's law applies in this case, and we end up with different, you know, your, your mileage will vary. Different types of simulations will see different benefits from the multi-core simulation. One of the benefits is that the choice of the number of cores to use is a runtime decision. Mm, okay. And so if I have a deeper number of cores, I have eight cores, let's say, I can map it for the full depth of those cores and my stacking horizontally is less long. I yeah. speed up my simulation and it scales fairly linearly. If I don't have that many cores available, I could map it to a fewer number, say I map it to four cores cores and then the stacking horizontally will be twice as long. Mm, okay. And so depending upon how much event density, if I'm doing a design for test in ATPG run that might take three weeks, I have a very light test bench, just applying patterns and then looking for results. And all of my event density is on the design side. So I could get a 10x or more improvement. So I can take that three week run and bring it down to a number of days. Nice. And I don't lose any capabilities. It's a simulation just like my simulation I'm used to. I have all four states, zeros, ones, x's, and z's. I can do X propagation. I can do all of the other things I need to do. I don't have to change anything in my design environment or in my test environment. It all works directly with my multi-core or my single core simulation. Okay, so Dave, testing based on use cases is getting a lot more popular these days. How can Excellium help me with these use cases? So that's a great question. One of the things that's important to recognize is that with multi-core simulation, I'm using a number of cores to speed my full chip tests up. Yeah. Full chip bugs are rare. We do a great job in regression testing of finding these bugs at the IP and block level. And then as we integrate, you know, continuing our testing of boundaries. But the problem is that as we get downstream, we do find those bugs. Yeah. And so while I'm doing regressions and I'm getting my overnight results and making my changes and fixing bugs that I'm finding, I can't wait for a multi-day full chip test. Right. That would be basically skipping multiple days of regression results and improvements. So if we can get a 3x, 5x improvement in performance and do a full chip test and find bugs in the same cycle as we're getting in our regression runs, right. we can now apply what I found in those full chip tests at the same time that I'm making changes for my regressions. Yeah. So now as I go through my flow, weeks down the road, months down the road, I'm not finding new bugs that now I have to go back and change mm -hmm. and redo my regression, redo my coverage because of those new changes. I'm right. able to find those much earlier. So this is a perfect example of how the multi-core for the full chip tests can really shift left in a way that benefits the IP and block level regression tests that are still so powerful and so needed. All right, Dave, I think it's time for recap time. Can you uh, give me your main points for me real quick? So thanks, Amelia. The main points are that with our multi-core engines, we've architected for fast system on-chip simulation. The ability to really bring full chip tests much earlier in the cycle to benefit both your regression test cycle, your IP and block level tests, and avoid those changes that happen further down the road that make you redo a lot of what testing and coverage proving that you've been doing today. Right. The single core engines are been restructured, re-architected. So as you move from your single core compiled code simulation in incisive or other simulators into your single core mode for regressions or for block level and IP testing in Excelium, you see a really nice improvement in performance, around 2x improvement on average. You see a much higher capacity because everything has been improved for handling the capacity of SOC level designs. And then we are continuing to add new productivity, new features to remove the manual effort that is inherent in so much of what we do. Mm. So our focus is not just on fast engines and not just on multi-core 
big SOC designs, but also on making the engine smart and improving how our fabric works together with the engines to dramatically improve the manual effort and the drudgery that a lot of verification engineers go through and help them really streamline their processes. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Dave. Thank you, Amelia. I really appreciate you taking time for this. Before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out more information about the Excellium Parallel Simulator from Cadence Design Systems. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talks section of eejournal.com or head on over to YouTube, keyword eejournal.